Let's just worship him this morning. room today to give you praise and glory and honor this morning, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in the midst of your church. Lord, for those who've gathered in this room, for those who are watching online on this snowy morning, Lord, we want the name of Jesus to be lifted high in the midst of the church. So be glorified, we pray, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. You glad to be in church this morning? Amen. Who's ready to worship the King of Kings today? Amen. Amen. Let's just lift up a shout of joy for the Lord today. Hallelujah. 
weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah. And heaven comes to fight for me.
Come on, let's just praise him, church. There is a hope today. It's not in anything that this world's going to offer us. It's not anything this world can give. Our hope is in Jesus alone. You know, Hebrews tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, it's in Christ alone that we have hope today. If you have a need today, I just want you to lift up your hand to the Lord. If you're at home this morning, maybe you're not feeling well or maybe you're just going through struggles, just want you to lift up your hands to Jesus right now. Whether in your living room, whether you're in this room today, just let's just lift up our hands before the Lord right now. And let's just come to Jesus and believe. Because no matter what you're experiencing today, Jesus is the answer. So Lord, we come before you. Recognizing that sometimes there's desperation in this world. Sometimes there's desperations in our lives, whether it be financial or health or marital or relationships, Lord, or anxiety or fear or depression. But Jesus, you, you and you alone are our hope. And so, Lord, today we take our eyes off of this world. We take our eyes off the medicine. We take our eyes off the government. We take our eyes off the bank accounts. We take our eyes off the jobs. We take our eyes off of other people. And Lord, we put our eyes and we fix our gaze on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We put our hope in you this morning. So for every need, Jesus for every need that is in this room, for every need that is within the sound of my voice, whether it be this morning in the 10 o'clock hour or later at another broadcast or when someone's watching this, Lord, you know each person and the time that they're watching this. And Lord, your word is alive. And it's powerful. And so we're trusting in you, God. We're trusting in you. And Lord, we want to pray for our nation today. God, there's such division in the land. Lord, we pray for our president. Lord, the one that holds office right now. Because your word tells us to pray for kings and those in authority. And God, we pray, Lord Jesus, over his life and for his family. We pray in this season, Lord, of unrest. We pray over all government leaders, whether it's Congress or Senate or courts. God, I pray that all the foolishness in this world would just be stopped by light of truth. God, I pray, Lord, not the truth I want or the truth that someone else wants, but I pray that the truth would be made real in this world. And Jesus, I pray over your people today. Because God, I see a time coming. You told us that, you told us in your word, you actually said that in the days before you return that we will see perilous times. But God, for your church, even in the midst of the peril, there is a peace. There is a rest. There is a hope. For the people of God. And Lord, right now I pray that as your people we would turn our eyes and our attention to you because you are that rest, that peace, and that hope. We just ask this all. Say it with me, church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Good morning, Destiny Church. It is such a blessing that after a long week, we can all gather together and worship the Lord. One of the ways that we worship is through giving. Some of our wonderful greeters will be right outside in the lobby after service to collect tithe and offering. There's also an easy and secure way to give online. 
If you go to our website, yourdestinychurch.org, you can just click on that Give tab. From there, you just fill out a simple form and boom, you've given. You can also mail in your tithe and offering to P.O. Box 144, Fort Lupton, Colorado, 80621. A great way to stay connected here at Destiny is to sign up for TextCaster. Go to yourdestinychurch.org and click on this tab that says Get Notification. You can receive updates by email or text or both. I highly encourage you to sign up for this and I promise we never spam you with a bunch of unnecessary stuff. It's a new year and we are ready to hit the ground running with a lot of cool stuff. So let's check out what's coming up here at Destiny. This Wednesday at 7 p.m. we'll be gathering here in the sanctuary for prayer. Prayer is an essential part of our church and I encourage you to come and be a part. Your prayer to the Lord makes a big difference. If you can't make it out in person, we are hosting a meeting on Zoom as well. The information for that meeting will be sent out via TextCaster. Coming up really soon, we are starting up our next round of discipleship groups. Be on the lookout for signups very soon. A unique group we're doing this time around is going to be a virtual study through the book of Hebrews that will be hosted by Pastor Rob and Miss Kimberly. This will be live and interactive via Facebook. We're really excited to offer this alternative take on a D group and if you're interested in taking part, please let Pastor know. On Friday, January 29th, I will be taking the youth group to a laser tag night at Summit in Thornton. It's only gonna cost $20 a student, so let me know today if you're going. Still a little ways out, but we have a couple guest speakers coming in on Valentine's Day. They lead a marriage and counseling ministry with focus on the family, and we are so excited to host them. Plan on being here that Sunday. If you want any more details about any of these announcements, talk to a staff person or check out the bulletin you were handed on your way in. Thank you guys all for worshiping with us today. Whether you're here in person or you're tuning in online, we are so glad that you're here. Now, if you cannot make it in person, now don't let that go back there. <laughs> The chair moved, and I was kind of like, where'd the chair go? The, uh, if you cannot make it in person, although we want you to be here in person because there's something that happens when we physically are together. But like last week, my wife was finishing up quarantine, and she was unable to be here. And she watched online, she goes, man, you can feel the power of God even if you're on the Zoom call. So I want to encourage you to tap in on that uh, on prayer meeting on Wednesday night and stuff. We have different people praying, different prayer focuses. We did a little bit of the word, not really preaching, but just maybe some a quick sharing of the word. Just want to encourage you to be a part of prayer on Wednesday. If you are not signed up for our text notifications, let me tell you, during this time, more than ever, it's very important, especially we don't know what's going on with social media over the next couple of weeks. Who knows what's going to happen with all of it. So I want to really encourage you to get on that text caster for notifications. You can go on our church's website. There's a link right on there. It takes you right to text caster. You put in your phone information. If you have a problem trying to sign up, please let us know. There should also be a number on there that you can call. Sometimes your cell phone service might not appear on their stuff, and they can help you. We can get you added um, with your phone number. I just need that information. But we want you, everyone to get notices because like mornings like today, if we had had like two feet of snow, we may have not had service, or we may have just gone online alone because now if I can get here, then we can at least just do online. And, uh, but I'm, we're glad for all of you who are here today. I would like to ask you just to bow your heads in prayer as well. I, I, there was something I wanted to pray for this morning that I didn't. Dennis McCleskey um, lost his mom yesterday. And Joyce Belville, her, um, her sister, is really um, at, the, at the end of life. And we just want to pray for those two members of our church family. Father, I want to pray, Lord, over Dennis and Leilani and Dennis's family. Lord Jesus, as, they, as he just had to say goodbye to his mom, Lord, yesterday. Lord, I just pray for your peace to surround this family during this time of mourning and grief. And Lord, that you would just minister to them, Lord, as only you can do. I also want to pray, Lord, for Joyce Belleville, Lord Jesus, as her sister who's dying from cancer, Father, is just reaching those last days of life, that, Lord, you would just minister to, to her heart and minister to Joyce and to the family as well during this season, Lord God. We know there's it's so hard because we're not able to always be with one another Lord, because of COVID, Lord, with our loved ones like we normally would. And I just pray for your comfort at this season. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Who's ready for the word today? Amen. Amen. Desperation to destiny. I don't know about you, but this week felt a little desperate to me. 
Well, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to get into the politics, but I don't care who's storming our nation's capital. I don't care what group it is that's storming them. Seeing people going into our nation's capital and sitting at the, the front desk and beating on windows and, and, and other things, regardless of what your interpretation of what happened, it's disturbing. It's very disturbing. And our nation is at such point of division. There's censorship coming into our country. There's so many things happening. Things feel desperate. Anybody else feel that way? They feel desperate. There's an old expression that says, desperate times call for desperate measures. There's some real truth in that. Desperate times do call for desperate measures. They don't call for unlawful measures. Y'all hear what I'm saying there? But as we feel life pulling us sometimes to places of of, of desperation, there's something that I realize. You know, the greatest periods of revival in history have come in seasons of desperation. Did you hear that? Are you listening at home? The greatest seasons of revival have come during times of desperation. Because when all the things in these, this world fails, we've been so blessed in our nation. We've had peace. We've had, we've had blessing. We've had prosperity. We've had freedom. And many people, as they see freedoms and, and, and things changing, no matter what side of, of, of the political fence you stand on, it's a scary thing. But as we feel that, we feel security come out from underneath us. But I'm reminded that how many people have lived through all of history under tyrannical governments? How many people have lived under, under desperate situations in their land before and still served God? Amen? Because we as Christians don't look to a government. We don't look to our health plans. We don't look to, we don't look to our bank accounts or to our jobs. We look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So the great news today, and we sang it this morning, is that hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And we don't have to despair. We don't have to lack hope. But we need to be praying. We need to be praying that God would use this season, this time, to make himself known in our world. Because we might not have a lot longer before Jesus comes back. You're all so quiet out there today. And there's plenty of you in the room, but you're so quiet. We don't have much time. You know, I was watching a video about the Great Reset. The Great Reset is setting a world economy. There have already been world forums on all of this. There's already been, and this is spoken not, not by conspiracy theory, but this is actually spoken by these different world groups of their desire to reset a world economy a worldwide government, a reset of finances and money internationally. They said that COVID was one of the thrusting things to move them towards that worldwide government. I got news for you. The great reset is the government of the Antichrist. Don't, don't be deceived, church. It's the, it's the reset, it's the, it's the move of the Antichrist in our world. But as we see that, people are going to see as freedoms go and as different censorships come in, which we've seen as things have been shut down this week, Something we need to realize is that we have to get our hope and our focus into Jesus. And that now is the time that in people's desperation, they need to know that Jesus is the real hope. As a church, we say that we are a hope-giving, Christ-honoring community of faith. It's something that's been on all of our literature, something that we've said from the pulpit, something that's, that's in some of our video and stuff, that we are to be a hope-giving, Christ-honoring community of faith. That means that we give hope to others by honoring Christ and bringing them into this community of faith that they might find their destiny, that they might find the true direction for life, the road that brings them to Jesus Christ, because that is where all hope really is. And last week as we set a, a, a model for our year, That overall is Jesus. That we will overcome anything through Jesus. And that we will overwhelm the world with Jesus. We need to realize that in people's time of desperation, they can find destiny. Are you with me? Are you really with me? Let me hear it through the mask. Are you with me? Let us be that hope-giving, Christ-honoring community of faith. Because you see, when we look to Jesus, we find destiny. I want to talk about three people in the Bible that went from desperation to destiny. 
I want to speak to you hope today from the word of God in different circumstances that people went from desperation to destiny. And the first is one who went from desperate from sin and wrong choices to finding destiny. Would you put that up, William? Desperate from sin and wrong choices. You might remember with me the story of a wee little man. How many, how many went to Sunday school when you were little and you heard the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. Some good, good old Sunday school songs. Zacchaeus was this short little guy who wanted to go see Jesus. And we remember him because he climbed up in a tree and hung in the branches so he could see Christ. But there's a lot more to a story than being a short dude who climbed up in a tree. In Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 9, we see a story. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector. Ooh. You know, they always say that short men get the short men syndrome for great power. And there was no greater power in your world than being the tax collector. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Who wants the government to give you back four times as much? Jesus responded, that wasn't the stimulus this week. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. You see, the story of Zacchaeus was, here's this, this little guy. He was a sinner by choice. Born, born a, a child of Israel, born a Jew, born into the household of, of, of God in the day. He should have been one that would have followed the, the, the teachings, the commandments of Moses that God had given on the mountain. But no, here this man decided, there are other things I want in life. There are choices I'm going to make so I can experience certain pleasures certain things that I desire. So he chose to be a tax collector. A tax collector was basically meant that he had to cheat people because that's what they did. That's how they gained their wealth. They didn't just collect for Rome. They collected for themselves. He would have to cheat his own people, his own nation, and use the tyranny of the Roman government to take advantage of others. And in doing so, because they became such outcasts, they would throw themselves into the most sinful of lifestyles. He decided that being with prostitutes and having drunken parties and gaining material things was worth more than serving God. He was willing to allow himself to be an outcast for that very reason because, you know, the only people who are willing to be friends of a tax collector are the sinners. Why? Because he can pay for the party. It wasn't because they wanted to be his friend. It's because he would pay for the party. He would pay for the prostitutes. He would pay for the, for the booze. He would pay for all the pleasures that would come upon them. And so his friends weren't really friends. And this man, this man who might have had money, might have had all the pleasures that the world had to have, who was a sinner by his choice, even though he knew the way, ends up finding himself isolated, looked down upon, hated, and despised. Because that's exactly what, an outcast to everybody around him. Some of us have made choices in our lives. Choices for pleasure. Choices for sin. Choices that we've known would be wrong. But we chose to ignore the teaching of God, ignore what God has shown us in his word, ignore the household of faith, and now we feel that place of desperation. Like we are outcasts. To God, like God would never want us, that God would never care about us. We might be known as that notorious sinner. We feel that we're trapped and we can never get out. But look at the story with Zacchaeus. 
Even though he had made the wrong choices, even though he was known, the people were so mad when Jesus said, let's go to his house, because he was a a notorious sinner. He was judged and condemned by society. And yet in his desperation, so desperate just to see Jesus, he humbled himself. You know, it's kind of humble if you're the short dude to climb up in a tree to see somebody. It's kind of like saying, hey, put me on your shoulder so I can see over the crowd. Might be good for a three-year-old, but when you're about 40, maybe not. You know what I'm saying? That's so why I love you, bro. In his desperation, he sought to find Christ. In his desperation, in his moment where no one would love him, where no one would ever take him back in, where no one would care, they would prefer he die than live. In his desperation, he reaches out to see Jesus, and Jesus sees him. And in that moment, he finds his destiny. He finds his destiny, and that's to become a man who's fair. That's to be a man who's going to give away half of his wealth and restore Four times what he stole from other people, in addition to giving away half of his wealth. And in that, he would find a destiny in Christ where his reputation, his connection with people, forgiveness would come to him and shame would be removed. And instead of being destined for hell and hated by all, he found hope because he found Christ. You see, desperation brings us to a place of salvation and our destiny in Jesus. The next thing I want to talk about is desperation from sickness. You know, sickness has a way when we get sick in our bodies of really making us discouraged. My family and I went through that COVID thing. And the one thing I despised about it was the depressed feeling that it gave me. It just made you feel like there was no hope in the world. It made you feel like everything in the world was bad, was wrong. I heard of a patient who who called in her, her medical attendant and said, call my family, I'm just giving up. And, you know, I, we, I realized, you know, it was kind of funny because they thought, well, they were just thinking that, you know, once you have this thing, it's over. But, no, it's because this thing can really it affect some people in the mood with a sense of desperation. But sickness does that. When you fight and you battle illness and you do it year after year after year, it can bring you low, it can bring you down. And there's a woman in the Bible that we're told about. Her condition rendered her unclean. You see, according to the, the, the law of Moses, there were certain things that if you had them or possessed them, you had to quarantine from society over a period of time past your sickness. Her sickness was that she had, that as a woman, she had an issue of bleeding, which normally meant that after your cycle, you had to, you had to separate yourself from everybody else and quarantine yourself for, for a week to ten days. After that, it ended. Well, she had the situation for a dozen years. You want to talk about being quarantined? You want to talk about being isolated, about being cut off? We're told that she spent every dollar she had, all of her money, anything she had earned, trying to get better because she had become an outcast and isolated because of sickness. I got to tell you, I've waited until I was over COVID for weeks to say something, until I could get antibody tests and prove what I had. Because I don't want to say because you're like, you feel like, oh, the world's going to look at you like you're poison. That's how this woman lived. Matthew chapter 9, verses 19 to 22 says, So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with them. Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that For 12 years, for 12 years, she found herself in a place of desperation with no money left, with no doctors left, with no treatment left, with no hope left. She was bound to spend the rest of her life or until she had hit a certain part of life where she would never be well and she would have to be alone, sick, hopeless. Feeling insufficient for life. You know, I tell you, some people who are fighting different illnesses, they feel insufficient for life. That their sickness makes them less of a person when it doesn't. But when you have tried everything else and nothing works, 
there is still hope. Yo, there is still hope. There are millions of testimonies through the years in the world of people who have found hope and healing through Jesus. There are millions of people through the years that God has touched, not just when Jesus walked this earth, but since when people in the church have prayed over them, that they have found a healing that could only come from the divine hand of God. Jesus looked at this woman and said, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I won't even bother him. Maybe just if I could just touch the hem of his garment, maybe I can be healed. And in that faith, Jesus met her desperation. You know, Jesus had no idea. He said, who touched me? I, I feel healing has gone out of my body. She never said, Jesus, pray for him. She just touched him, got a hold of him in her desperation, and Jesus healed her. Do not think you are beyond being touched by the Lord. Do not think you might feel yourself You might feel there's a mental state to your life. You might feel there's a physical state to your life. You might feel like something's going on in your life that you need healing for, and you feel like it is just beyond any hope. Maybe you've spent lots of money trying to fix it, but you know it's in our desperation. It's in our humility. It's in that dependence that our need of Christ becomes obvious, and just a touch of faith is rewarded with destiny in Christ. You know, I believe in the, in, the, in the months and if there are years left to come that people are going to come to such places of desperation in our world. I believe that the church is going to have to, we're not, we might not be able to depend on doctors in the days ahead. We might not be able to depend on, on, on medical help or attention or different things. We don't know what is coming up and what awaits Christianity and Christians. But I want you to know that in our desperation we can call on Jesus. He is our hope. And sometimes we have thought we don't need to call on Jesus. Why? Because we can go to the doctor, we can go to the pharmacy, we can go and get all the help that we need. We don't need to call on Jesus. But when desperation sets in, that's when we realize, I need to call on Jesus. And there are going to be people around us in this world who are going to be finding that desperation that if you call on Jesus for them, I believe God's going to heal them and show himself. Because Desperation from sickness can lead us to destiny. A destiny of a new life found in Jesus Christ, healed and made whole. Do you believe that today? Say yes if you believe that. The third thing is desperately bound. I find that people who are in bondage to addictions feel the most or the least hope. They feel the most hopeless. Bondage to addictions, bondage to a behavior, bondage to a substance, bondage to something where the spiritual powers of darkness have such a hold on us that they dominate life. There are so many people today that they would rather fight for acceptance in society to live in their bondage rather than fight to be free from it. Come on. Come on. That's what's going on in our world today. The world is so bound up in in perverse lifestyles. The world is so bound up in immorality. The world is so bound up in things that God wants to set them free from. But rather than come in desperation to God and be free, they would rather fight to hold on to their ability to stay in that bondage and say, you all have to accept my problem. That is what the war is in our world today. That is why so many have turned some of their thoughts. If you notice, people's political values go upon the circumstance that they're in. Not based on truth, not based on what God's word says, not based on what morality is. And there are so many today, they're bound in drugs, they're bound in alcohol, they're bound in perversion, they're bound in alternative lifestyles. Many have wanted to be free, but they don't know how to become free. They have truly been overcome, and I'm going to say this, by demonic forces. 
by spiritual darkness in their life that has gained entrance into their lives. Do you know what brings demonic forces into our lives? Unforgiveness, woundedness, anger, bitterness. As I was reviewing this message this morning, I was reminded of this young girl. I don't even remember. I think I just did, but I'm not going to use it. Her name. I think it just came to my mind. I remembered her last name. Remember her family. Remember her circumstance. We lived in this little community, and we had taken a group of kids to summer camp. And it was a night that they invited kids to come up and receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And this young girl was up at the altar, and she was praying, and the power of God was coming down upon her very, very, very powerfully. And she was opening up her heart to receive the Holy Spirit, not just salvation, but the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And something began to clash physically within her. Because, you see, this young girl, barely even 12 years old, was possessed. And you go, wow, that's kind of deep, Pastor. Oh, it's more real than we realize it is. Why? Why a young girl like that? Because she had been abused. Someone else's abuse upon her had damaged her life and spiritually opened her to being in this circumstance in life. And now where her heart was responding to the Lord saying, God, come into my life and free me, there was a physical clash. But as we prayed for her, God set her free. There was woundedness in her life. There was bitterness, even though she was young, because she had been hurt at such a young age by such horrible things. She wasn't even living with her real family at the time. And it brought her into a place of bondage. There are people today in our world that they don't realize that the choices that they're making in life have brought them there because of the hurt and the pain been brought into their life and because they've not been able to forgive or to let go of wounds or to get rid of the anger or yield the bitterness. And the enemy uses that to flood into their lives and bring a, a, a bondage over them that then plays out through the sin in their life, whether that sin is alcoholism or drug addiction or pornography problems or, or homosexuality or obesity or whatever else it could be. And people can feel like they are truly bound, but I want to let you know, Jesus set that, that girl free that day and filled her with the Spirit. So much so that there's a bunch of other young girls. I love, I love summer camp. I love it when kids get touched by Jesus. There's a bunch of other girls like 10 years old over on the side. They were praying. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. They were just praying in the Spirit over there, these four little girls, just, just speaking other languages and worshiping Jesus. And they opened their eyes and they literally saw the demon come out of this girl and run away. They were such in a spiritual place that they could see that demonic presence leave and flee, not just out of the girl, but out of the tabernacle that we were all praying in. And then they were a little freaked out. <laughs> and we had to teach them. We had to teach them because spiritual bondage is real. And people live in chronic deception. They, they engage in chronic criminal behavior. They engage in constant acts that bring them into bondage. It's not because they themselves are bad people, but somehow the enemy got a stronghold in their life and is holding them in a place of bondage where they seem hopeless. They are desperate to be free. We have the answer in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer for those who are bound. Jesus said, I came to set at liberty those who are captive. And he's looking for a church who's willing to overwhelm others with the hope and the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus wants to set people free. And I believe as we come into days of greater desperation in this world, people are going to be wanting to be free from the things that bind them. Nothing in this world is going to satisfy. They're going to see, we're going to begin seeing tyranny play out to where people all think it's going to be wonderful and great. We're going to get all of our free checks from the government. They're going to wipe out our debts. They're going to do all these great things. But then we're going to see what reality is all about in these circumstances. I'm not preaching politically today. I'm just preaching about freedom and no, not having freedom. And when people come to realize that they're not only now bound within themselves, but bound by their circumstances around them, they're going to come looking for hope. Will we, the church, be ready to offer that hope to them? 
Because when people are desperate for Christ, he's ready to show them their destiny. In Matthew 17, verses 14 to 21, it says, At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus' disciples couldn't do it. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy and it left him for that moment the boy was well. From that moment the boy was well. Afterward the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? Because you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Church, we need to come back to the place where we have faith. We need to come back to the place the world can't see a weak church. They don't need to see a political church. It's time to give up the politics. It's time to let go of the political scenarios. You can have your feelings about them. And I, I bet you there's probably about 20 different viewpoints in this room today. But you got to give them up and start focusing on Jesus Christ because people are going to be desperate for the hope that only Jesus can bring. And if we are not in a position of faith to believe for them, how are they going to be healed? The interesting thing in the bound is this, that those who are in bondage, is that often they cannot come to find the desperation for themselves. They need someone to believe for them. They need someone to act for them. And this boy's father brings his son to Jesus, says, your disciples already couldn't do it, but I'm not going to stop until I know that you have had the final authority and the final word on my son's situation. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it was gone. Church, I want you to know, however, today that as people of God, as people who are part of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of hope, you have the power within you to speak to the demon and see it be gone. You have the power to pray in the name of Jesus and see bondages in your children's lives, to see bondages in your spouse's lives, to see bondages in your friend's life. Be released. We don't have faith, but we don't pray. We don't seek God. We don't pursue the things of God. We are no longer intercessors, and so our faith is not strong, and therefore we just give up and let people say, well, that's their choice. Let them stay in their bondage. Oh, if the church would just come to the realization that in desperate times it calls for desperate measures. You know what the desperate measure is? It's not putting a president in the air and having an emergency, an emergency broadcast system. It's not putting a whole other party in power so they can grant wishes like a genie. Desperate measures, it's getting in touch with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We need to come to that place that we can be those intercessors because in each of these circumstances, in each of these circumstances, it was faith that made the difference. You've tried all the rest, now try the best. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And the desperate measure for us is to come to the place of being in Christ and being so full of God and being so focused on Jesus that those who have made sinful wrong choices find salvation in Jesus. That those who are sick are healed in Jesus' name. That those who are bound are delivered from their bondage. You can bring that hope to that family member. And each of these people found their destiny for salvation, healing, and deliverance, and to becoming a part of the kingdom of God because they got desperate enough to forsake this world and find their hope in Christ. Today we need to discover God's plan. God's plan. It doesn't matter what CNN or Fox or Epic Times or OAN, or CBS, or ABC. It doesn't matter what any of them are saying. What matters is what Jesus says. It's time for us 
to surrender to him and to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because it's in him that we go from desperation to destiny. And I believe that there is a time coming, that there's going to be a season that we will have, no matter what's going on in our world, that as the world grows more desperate, there will be people searching to find true destiny. We, God has called you and I. He's called us to be the people who will lead them to that place. So even if you're not in a place of feeling desperation today, you can be the bridge to someone finding their destiny by pointing them to Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Can I have the whole praise team come? If you're watching at home today, would you bow your heads with us? Because I believe that there are people in this room, I believe that there are people who are listening online, there are people who are going to be watching this days from now. But right where you are at right now, don't turn off, don't cut out, but hold on. Because I want you to remember that hope has a name. Praise team, if you go to that one, I'm pretty sure you figured that out by now. Hope has a name. Jesus wants to take us from desperation to destiny. Will you put your hope in him today? Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we get the soundboard turned on, please? church. every eye closed and every head bowed. Wherever you are today, whatever you're going through this morning, there is hope. I want to challenge you, church, to take your desperation and turn it to destiny today. With all eyes closed, never head bowed, can I get the house lights on? If you're in this room this morning, I want to just encourage you right now. If you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ, if you need to turn something over to the Lord today, if you need to surrender a wrong choice, if you need to bring your sickness before him, if there's a bondage in your life today, He's here in this room this morning. And if you're watching online today on this snowy morning, I want you to know he's in your living room right now as well. He sees you right where you are. He sees you as you're sitting. He knows what you're doing. And he's right there. And no matter what your circumstance, he wants to let you know that he is there in your moment of desperation. So Jesus, would you just lift up your hands with me? If you have a need, just lift up your hand before the Lord right now. Lord, whether it's sin, whether it's bondage, whether it's healing, whether it's a need to return to you in salvation today, 
Lord, we know that if we confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That all we have to do is call on the name of Jesus. Put our faith in you. And so, Lord, right now, we come to you with whatever we are going through. Whatever bondage, whatever sickness, whatever sin. And Jesus, we say, heal me, forgive me, set me free. Come on, if you have it, just say, Lord Jesus, heal me, forgive me, set me free. Whatever that need is right now, he's here in this room. We might have to be six feet from each other, but he's as close as the next person next to you today, your family member. He's as close as you are to you this morning. Just reach out to him and let him touch you this morning. You don't need the physical touch of my hand. You need the touch of Jesus. Just touch the hem of his garment this morning and allow his hope to fill you this morning. Jesus. 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 Heal. Set free. Lord, I come against right now bondages in the name of Jesus. Lord, you didn't call your people to be bound to sexual sin. You didn't call your people to be bound to addiction. You didn't bring, call your people to be bound, Lord Jesus, to unforgiveness or bitterness. Lord, heal the wounded heart. Heal the broken spirit. Heal the sickened body. Lord, set us free from those things that hold us in bondage. Jesus. 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 Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we serve a God of hope. Help us to be your light to those around us. That, Lord, when others are desperate that, Lord, we can speak that hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. So, Father, I pray that you'd empower your church today as we go forth from this place, that you'd be glorified in every life this morning, every home, and that you would allow hope to go forth from this place. For we ask and say with me, church, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, bless your people as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless as you go today.